Hey everybody, thanks for clicking on this video and I hope everybody is doing well and in good spirits. I would like to welcome all of our new subscribers to this channel and I certainly hope that if you can safely give it a thumbs up and a like. Um, I certainly hope you will do that because we don't want anybody outing themselves by connecting a like um, on your social media to this channel. But um, I want to get right into this video because it's um, a little bit that I need to cover. Um, back on July 14th, Kim and I received an email from DG, and I just kind of want to read it to you um, and explain a certain um, terminology. Um, this is what the email states. There is a viewpoint containing concerning Bible prophecy that needs to be looked into. The theological term for this doctrine is called preterism. P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-M. You can go to, to Google, type in the word, and there's a couple of different pronunciations. One of them is real strong, the other one's not. But for the sake of argument, preterism. Okay. In a nutshell, it teaches that all prophecy was already fulfilled by the end of the first century. Anyone who believes in this doctrine is called a preterist. There is a somewhat entertaining video that further explains this on YouTube entitled, You Gotta Be Kidding, Right? The channel it's on is called Fulfilled Communications Group. Now, I went to that particular video that DG is um, pointing to here, and it's an hour and 23 minute long video. But um, what Kim did is she went and she uh, went to Google, typed in the word, and then I'm going to do a little bit of reading from this so we can kind of simplify things for the benefit of PIMOs, Jehovah's Witnesses that have not heard this terminology. I have heard a similar argument, but I've never heard it referred as to paternism. Okay. Um, and I'm going to be reading some stuff and explaining some things from the book, The New Testament by Stephen L. Harris, because some of this is covered in it, but it's actually viewed from the perspective of false prophecies or unfulfilled prophecies. So let me get into this and I'll make an application directly to the Watchtown Babble Crap Society, because a lot of Christians actually fall for this. But let me finish reading the email here. Um, I've tried to ask a lot of people, including Jehovah's Witnesses, questions concerning this, and they can't give a straight answer. Like Matthew 10.23. Jesus told his disciples that they will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Okay. If you believe that the fulfillment of Bible prophecy is still in the future then the disciples should still be alive and well and to this very day if they are still roaming the streets of Israel. I doubt very much that there are 2,000 year old men in Israel still awaiting Christ's return. Another such scripture is found at Luke 21-22. Um, this one makes it very clear that all of these things were to happen in the first century. And look at the personal pronouns when you when you read the words of Jesus and the words of Paul in his letters. And I'm going to address a contradictory thought regarding Paul in his letters and his choice of words. They are addressing the people of their day, not us in the 21st century. The book of Revelation was written to the seven churches in Asia Minor in the first century, not to the seven churches in the 21st century America. If you wish, I can send you a book written by Glenn Hill, which gets to the point. If not, the video should suffice. Well, there again, with all of the study and all the research that I've been doing for the past 12 years, this thought process really isn't anything new to me. Okay. 
and I have oodles and oodles and oodles of reference material from scholars such as Bart Ehrman and things like that. But what I want to point to is some of the content that was downloaded on uh, Proturism, okay? And what this really has to do, friends, is it has to do with the early church and some of the Protestant Reformation because we have to look at the history of the church and orthodoxy and if you didn't accept church orthodoxy you were persecuted. A lot of that church orthodoxy has to do with the later fulfillment of these prophecies that were not fulfilled in Jesus day presumably. Okay. Um, so I just kind of want to read a little bit here, um, starting right here. It says, Moses Stewart noted in 1845 that Alscar's Praetorist interpretation advantaged the Roman Catholic Church during its arguments with the Protestants. And Kenneth Newport, in an eschatological commentary in 2000, Describe uh, preterism as a Catholic defense against the Protestant historicist view which identified the Roman Catholic Church as a persecuting apostasy. And we all know that in the Dark Ages, the Church did persecute people if you did not fall in line with their view of the Bible. It's a form of terrorism. Okay, but I want to go to a couple pages over. It's five pages long. And this is where it really gets interesting as far as I'm concerned because I understand things in a much, much more deeper application than what most people would today. Just regurgitating ancient, ancient theology, ancient, ancient concepts, okay? And this is what it says here on page 4, under the heading, Interpretation of the Great Tribulation. And this is where it really applies to Jehovah's Witnesses, because Jehovah's Witnesses definitely believe in the Great Tribulation. Okay, this is what it reads. In the Proterist view, the Tribulation took place in the past when Roman legions destroyed Jerusalem and its temple in 70 AD during the end stages of the f the first Jewish Roman war and it affected only the Jewish people rather than all mankind now with that being stated if you believe in preterism then today the Bible holds no grip on you Okay, because Christians today have to believe, they have to believe Watchtower's concept that Jesus' spoken words have a dual application. They had a minor fulfillment in Jesus' day, which by extension, even Watchtower admits the prophecies were fulfilled. In Jesus day but they use the word a minor fulfillment but they have a greater fulfillment today which still steals your mind from you they're still using that construct of fear by getting you to believe that there's a dual application to these prophecies you know just like Jesus prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem. Not one stone will be left upon a stone, but yet that wailing wall that everybody bounces their head off of still exists. And you talk to some Christian Baptist, even in this community, they will tell you that the Ark of the Covenant will be discovered somewhere in that wailing wall and every stone's going to be dismantled to get to the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, so see, there's a greater fulfillment. This is the nonsense that encapsulates these people's 
mind. Just like Jehovah's Witnesses, when a prophecy has not been fulfilled to their expectation, they're going to recontract that prophecy, such as the generation of 1914 will not pass away until all these things occur, occur, including the start of the Great Tribulation. That generation is dead and gone. It did not meet their full expectation as they presumed Jesus spoke to this prophecy in a dual application. So now it's the overlapping generation. See? They continue to buy themselves time getting people to believe that the Bible has some sort of value from a prophetic sense. And the book of Revelation does the exact same thing. Okay? But what you're really getting involved with friends is Roman propaganda okay I mean stop and think about the amount of fear that Watchtower still exerts in the mind of Jehovah's Witnesses through this fear of futuristic fulfillment of Bible prophecy they get Jehovah's Witnesses to relinquish their life by stating something as, well, we're given a commission to go out and preach, okay? And if you have a desire to become a musician, an artist, or anything, a sports star, you need to put that on hold for in the new system when we have eternal life, which is a Bible prophecy sometime to be fulfilled in the future, you will get to do all those things. But right now, right now, you have to preach. So you surrender your life to that concept because they've gotten you to believe that there's a future application of these Bible prophecies. They also get you to believe, Jehovah's Witnesses, that you are pleasing God by not accepting blood transfusions and in all reality you n become nothing more than a legalized human sacrifice bleeding out in that operating room table. In every single control mechanism that any Christian based religion uses can absolutely be found in the Bible. That's why they come out and say, well, see, there's a dual application, okay? And they'll even get you to say, well, look, independent thinking is satanic. But how is your independent thinking any different than the independent thinking of your religious controllers by making you believe and think that Jesus spoke to a dual prophetic prophecy? It had a minor fulfillment in Jesus' day, but it has a major fulfillment in the future, including the book of Revelation. You know, one such thing in the book of Revelation that they continue to point to is Satan being thrown out of heaven, you know, in 1914, woe for the earth because the Satan has come down to you and all of this. But what a thorough investigation of that concept reveals, I'm going to show a picture, that that motif and that concept is very ancient. Let me read what this caption says. A Mesopotamian God, now we should all recognize Mesopotamian God is Baal. It's not Yahweh. But see, Christians have come along, Jewish Christians have come along, who and whenever have actually pointed to this being Yahweh now instead of Baal. So even that has changed because of unfulfilled prophecies, unfulfilled expectations. But what they do is they move these to the future because they recognize there was no greater fulfillment in the past. So let me reread this. Mesopotamian God battling a seven-headed dragon. Revelation's image of the Archangel Michael defeating a great red dragon with seven heads 
has a long pedigree, extending at least as far back as the Sumerian early dynastic period. When this plaque showing a divine warrior battling the primal monster of chaos was designed. Biblical writers preserve aspects of this ancient conflict myth in reference to Yahweh's struggle with Leviathan, another name for the prime evil serpent. Apocalyptic writers commonly reapply traditions about the pre-creation struggles between forces of order and chaos to events of end time, as does John of Patmos, who also identifies the original serpent with Satan and the devil. But what you friends don't recognize, and what Jehovah's Witnesses will completely fail to recognize, is that even in the construct, even in your belief system that Jesus, through Michael the Archangel, consigned Satan to the abyss for a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, you will have reached perfection. And what does God do? He lets that serpent out of the abyss to once again create chaos and wreck havoc. But what you fail to recognize, that Jehovah is the God of chaos. Because it's his choice. It's his ego. It's his desire to be the only God worshipped that he does this. Because what happens at the end of the thousand years when Satan is let loose? Well, our, our perfection is put to the test. And if you become imperfect at that time, God will kill you forever and ever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. It's the same motif that is completely reoccurring. But these Bible writers in today's modern religionists know how to use this to get you to surrender your sovereignty to them. And the Apostle Paul was no different. Look at what the Apostle Paul said. Those of us that survive to the end, we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, and we will meet the Lord in the air. That didn't happen. The Apostle Paul falsely prophesied. Or, if you, were, if you subscribe to the uh, uh, preterism point of view, that was already fulfilled. It has no application for us today. I want to read something else from this book. I've got two pages here that I want to refer to. One of them regarding the Apostle Paul, because this is where Christians fail to heed caution, pay attention to caution, okay? Here on page 308, there's three columns. And within these three columns are the Apostle Paul's writings. The first column, these are letters that Bible scholars know the Apostle Paul wrote. It would be 1 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Romans, Philemon, and Philippians. The second column are letters possibly not by Paul. So these letters are in question as to whether Paul wrote them or not. 2 Thessalonians and Colossians. Now the third column is letters that the scholars definitely know were not written by the Apostle Paul. Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Hebrews. And in parentheses, even in early Christianity, most churchmen did not believe that Hebrews was Paul's work. How is it that these men can state this? 
Well, I want to go over now to page 387, and I want to read from the heading, the pastorals, Letters to Timothy and Titus. Okay, I want to read this. Pay attention, please. In the opinion of most scholars, the case against Paul's connection with the pastorals is overwhelming. Besides the fact that they do not appear in early lists of Paul's canonical works, the pastorals seem to reflect conditions that prevail long after Paul's day, perhaps as late as the first half of the second century CE. Lacking Paul's characteristic ideas about faith and spirit, they are also unpauline in their flat prose style and different vocabulary. In parentheses, containing 306 words not found in Paul's unquestioned letters. Furthermore, the pastorals assume a church organization far more developed than that current in the apostles time so let me break this down real easy in the letters they know Paul wrote Paul is very much pro women by the time you get to Timothy and whatnot Paul's telling the women to sit down shut up and learn in silence that's how you know that this book the Bible is completely tampered with it's not that difficult and there again you have to realize how much Roman propaganda is actually infused go back to uh, Constantine in the Nicene Council you have that marriage of church and state perhaps is that not the dual world power church and state they're the ones that say these 66 books are absolutely the Word of God. But see, when you believe that these prophecies have already been fulfilled, then the mechanism that is designed by the church and state no longer has a hold on you. That's why religions and organizations like Jehovah's Witnesses come along and say, no, no, there's a dual application. Well, Watchtower, that dual application, from your perspective, has 100% failed because that generation is dead and gone. And I can guarantee the Baptists in this community, no one is ever going to allow that wailing wall to be torn down stone by stone, brick by brick, to find the lost Ark of the Covenant. This game is over with. Because what a lot of people don't realize, and not wanting to throw the baby out with the bathwater, a lot of this Bible contains what happens at the changing of an age. And if you know what to look for, then you can actually see this in scripture okay so let me backtrack I've done a video on this before but it's it's worth rebuilding right here once again okay when you look at Moses coming off of the uh, Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments what does he see he sees the Israelites still worshiping the golden calf that's connected to the age of Taurus the bull. What does Moses do? He destroys that image and from there on out you read in the text everything that's related to the age of Aries the ram. They're blowing the ram's horn, they're looking for the Lamb of God, and by the time that motif is carried down to the day of John the Baptist, he pronounces prophetically when Jesus is approaching, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So all this time, the nation of Israel is looking for this Lamb of God, their Messiah. Okay. Now what do we see from the, and during that age, 
of Aries the Ram, you see a lot of loss as it relates to human life. Even, even Moses, at that point of breaking the Ten Commandments, orders the death of those still worshiping the golden calf, and then Yahweh, Jehovah, or if you're a Trinitarian, Jesus chimes in and kills another 24,000 Israelites. At the changing of these ages, you should be able to pinpoint a massive loss of human life because these things are recorded for us but we're not taught to look for it we're taught to deflect from those aspects when you see Jesus bring in the age of Aquarius that age of Aries the Ram is passing. How do we know that we see that passing? Well, not only do we see everything associated with the age of Aquarius written out in scripture, such as, you know, the fish. We all know that um, the age of um, Pisces is associated with the two fish. I might have things mixed up here because I'm trying to keep all of this straight. But Jesus is associated with the age of Pisces, the two fish. Everything that Jesus speaks about from a religious perspective or a human perspective has to do with fish. Cast your nets on the other side of the boat. They brought in so many fish. Their nets were tearing. Uh, Jesus said, I will make you fishes of, of men. Um, upon Jesus' resurrection, Peter jumps out of the boat, runs to the seashore, and what's Jesus doing? Cooking a couple of fish. And even symbolically, Christians have identified themselves with the fish. So you can see the incoming of that age of Pisces. But what happens in 70 CE? When you see the changing of the ages. Because Jesus said, I will be with you until the end of the age, according to the King James Version. Not the end of the world, but the end of the age. The end of the eon. What do you see? You see the Roman armies going through and destroying human life. 70 CE is a marked point in human history. Everybody knows it. Nobody denies it. And there's some research material out there suggesting that half of the Earth's population was wiped out at that time. That's obviously debatable. But let's bring the changing of the age down to our time period. Okay, What we are seeing, perhaps, because this is recorded, you know, even the Apostle Paul I believe in the book of Romans talks about that men will abandon the use of the female and become violently inflamed with each other. That happened in Paul's day. He's writing down what was happening at the change of that age. Um, in Timothy, even though Paul didn't write it, but let's give the devil his due. First, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, Jehovah's Witnesses, ex-Jehovah's Witnesses are very familiar with that. In the last days, critical times, hard to be here, uh, blah, 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 for men will be lovers of themselves, self-assuming, disobedient to parents, and further reading, having a form of godly devotion, watchtower, and proving false to its power. It's okay to lie under oath. We're just going to call it theocratic warfare. These are things that can be identified with the changing of the age. And we see that today. Since we are leaving the age of Pisces and we're now creeping into the age of Aquarius and what's symbolized by this age is a water boy, a man, dumping a pitcher of water. That is symbolizing washing away the old and bringing in the new. Okay? I like to view it as 
that water boy dumping over the pitcher and letting those two fish flop out on dry ground. Dry ground. What do we see from this perspective right now? Well, we see an absolute, I don't want to use the word attack on the Bible, but we do see greater understanding of this book. Archaeology proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that the Israelites worshipped both the divine male and the divine feminine. Those things can no longer be hidden. They're being washed away. When you look at the Bible from Jesus' perspective, either Watchtower makes him a false prophet, or he himself is a false prophet, because those people did die without seeing the second coming of Christ. Those things are being washed away. The book of Revelation since we now know these older motifs, and I refer back to that picture of some Mesopotamian god trying to control the seven-headed dragon, chaos, we see that being washed away as an old motif that religionists try to keep alive today because it's a controlling mechanism through fear. Okay? But regarding the loss of human lives at the changing of an age, you don't have to think that far back to the pandemic, do you? How many human lives were lost during that pandemic? And some of those human lives could have been saved by a certain little horse medicine. And even now, as of last week, on Fox Business News, Maria Bartiromo read a report from the CDC that this certain horse medicine can now be used as effective medicine against that certain pandemic word, <coughs> COVID. The end of these ages are clearly identifiable it's not the end of the world, as Watchtower likes to make Jehovah's Witnesses think and believe, but it's the end of an age. And there are descriptive terms in this Bible that point to that, but you as Christians and Jehovah's Witnesses are not taught to look at that because then the religion loses control of you. They lose control of your money and they lose control over your lives. Once you begin to do this study and research like I've done, then you will be able to stand in front of anybody and say, I am a free, sovereign being. Because these entities no longer control you because everything that I just mentioned and pointed to is what happens at the changing of an age. Look at the moral character of the world today. Look at the moral character of Christians today. They will lie under oath and call it theocratic warfare. It's not difficult to comprehend any of this, but you have to learn to resonate up here. Stop resonating at ground level. Because when you resonate this low, it is so much easier for somebody to control your life, your money, everything, your thoughts. They tell you independent thinking is satanic. But when you get rid of that concept, which is ground level resonating and resonate up here, you can see what a crock that concept really is. If you honestly believe as a Christian that you were, um, you were created in God's image, then why do, you let, why do you allow some men with a book that can be easily debunked, <clears throat> washed away with the age of Pisces, still control you to this day? 
That's why Kim and I keep saying, do your own study, do your own research, understand some things such as preterism. Okay? Realize that religions today are using this Bible as a weaponized mechanism against you. It does actually become a book of terrorism. If you don't believe that you're going to burn in hell, if you don't believe you won't make it into the new system, it's not difficult. It's truly not difficult. It takes a lot of time and effort to go back and reread and see what this book is actually telling you, especially as it relates to the end of an age. And we are at that point now. Look at, look at the amount of information that's available today that wasn't available, say, perhaps even 20 years ago. And look at the mass communication that we have available today. We can educate one another literally the click of a button and or at that same click of a button you can make a living out of bullshitting people. It's not difficult but ultimately the choice is up to you. Are you going to continue to believe that this book from a prophetic sense has value? Or are you going to continue to do your study, research, and conclude what I have? That I am a free, sovereign being. The choice is yours. Thanks for watching and have a great day.